So it was the first rock and roll club in Liverpool. John Paul and George as the quarrymen opened the club. But what club was it? And I bet it's not the one you're thinking of. I'm being joined by my friend, Anthony Hogan, author and historian to explain more. 54 Bro Green Road, the home and birthplace of Alan Caldwell. You and me um, are gonna know more better as Rory Storm. He was born here in, um, on the 7th of January, 1938. He went on to form the band Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, who were a big part of the Mercy Beat. And the house itself became a mecca for him anybody who was anybody in Mercy Beat. So after shows, they'd all power back here, chip butties, cups of tears off Rory's Mumbai. Um, um, as we said, anyone who's anyone, but the main friends of Rory Storm at the Hurricanes were a small band you might have heard of called The Beatles, and they, they spent a lot of time here. Now here's the front door, which is a brand new front door, and Rory of course didn't go through that one, but the doorstep is what we're interested in, because that is the original step when the house was built, the original um, tiles are there, and the step, that's all original. So. Everyone who's been here, Rory, all the other bands, John, Paul, George, Ringo, they've all walked on that step. So it's a very historic step. Unfortunately, we can't cut it out and take it away, can we, David? So we're stuck with that. So Rory became interested in music, and he was at the time of him in the Skiffle Band, so he wanted to form a Skiffle Band, but he couldn't play a guitar. Now, when he was in the bathroom, in the back bathroom, he'd always hear someone playing a guitar and he was playing the rock and roll songs that Rory was hearing on Radio Luxembourg and things and he was thinking, if only I could find this guy, who is it? And he'd look everywhere and he'd never spot anyone playing a guitar and he'd think, if I could find him, I could start something, something might happen. So Alan had decided he wanted a band, he wanted to learn a guitar, but first he had to get hold of a guitar. He was in work and he got a tip for the horse in the Grand National. So we went along to the Grand National, all the money he had, and he thought if it wins, I've got a guitar. So he stood by the winning post, coming running up, and he'd, he jumped, the water jumped that wasn't there, landed flat on his belly, and all the other horses ran past. And Alan had lost his money and his guitar, and he was fuming. And he walked out of the race course, he got on the 61 bus back home and he was every name under the sun, he was saying everything. He went upstairs, sat at the back, a few thumps on the seat, whatever, he was angry. And then he heard somebody playing a guitar. And he looked at the front of the bus and, and he was a young lad playing a guitar. So he, he went over and sat by him and said, you're very good. And he started chatting away. And it turned out that, that, that the lad he was talking to was called John Byrne, who actually lived if, if you look across the road, Rory's house is the grey house and if you look this way, John's is the house just behind the 20 miles an hour road sign. So they, they both discovered that they live close to each other and then it dawned on Rory. The guy I've been listening to from the bathroom while I'm brushing my teeth, this is him. So they'd met each other. So Rory said to, to, to John, I'd like to form a band and John said, we well, can form a band with me. And Rory said, I haven't got a guitar. And he said, well, you can get a guitar. And he said, well, I can't play a guitar. And he said, well, I'll learn you how to play a guitar. And, and that was it. The friendship was formed. That was the start of the Hurricanes coming together, the first two. So once they'd formed a band, they've got Johnny, they've got Rory, Ty, Lou, and Richard, who become Ringo Starr, of course. They practice actually in the hallway of the house here. The lads would go on the steps, they'd sit on the steps with their guitars, Rory would sing, Ringo would be stuck at the bottom with his, probably just his snare drum, because you couldn't get the drum kit in there, and that's where they practice, or they practice in the backyard. But the neighbours weren't too happy about it all the time, so they'd sometimes practice in Johnny's house, which was just around the corner. So, so this is the site of the house Balgowny, which was owned by a Mrs Thompson. Um, a very old house, which is obviously gone now. Um, back in the day, she used to rent out rooms to nurses. Um, Rory and Johnny knew it, and they asked, could we practice in your basement? And she said, yes. So they started practicing. Then they came up with the idea, what if we turn it into a venue? 
somewhere for kids to come and watch the band. So they asked there, and Mrs. Thompson being a, a fantastic person she was, said, yes, you can. So they painted it black, they put skeletons on the wall with the help of art students, I might add, not just Johnny and Rory. And they put some light in and a tiny stage. They had no license, of course. They actually put an advert in the local paper for the opening and left off the address on purpose because they had no license. That meant that nobody knew where it was. So on the opening night, on the 13th of March, 1958, they only had 30 people turn up, but it was still good. 30 people watched the Texans as they were then, not really Storm Hurricanes, the Texans, and another band called The Quarrymen. Minus George, who didn't play for that night for some reason, but he played on other nights. Now it was open on a Tuesday and a Thursday evenings. It only ran for six weeks because once we did get out about the place, it became popular. On one night, they had over 100 people in. One of the bands playing as well was called The Blue Jeans, who ended up being called The Swing and Blue Jeans. So you've got three of the biggest Mersey Beat bands playing as skiffle bands at this time. Now they couldn't charge an entry fee, so what they did was they said everyone's got to buy an honest juice or a coke. That got them in, and the band got paid by passing around an old teapot and hoping someone put a few coppers in for them. But that doesn't matter, it's the importance of the, of the place. It proved one of these places could be popular. And these obviously progressed on to the Casbah, which took it all to a different level, of course. But it was their foresight, it was fantastic foresight. And the foresight of Mrs. Thompson to give them the, the, the opportunity. Now, the reason it ended is because of a neighbor, Mr. Brown, who didn't like to see people have fun. And he wasn't very happy about the noise that obviously more people came, the noise as they were leaving, in the smooching that was going on, as he said, the bottles left in the garden. Now, Rory did try to do something about this, or Alan, as his name was then, not Rory. And it, he actually handed out posters to people coming in saying, please be quiet as you leave by order of the management, Alan Caldwell. So he was even having the foresight to try and be like, I'm a big manager. But in the end, Mr. Brown got, got people involved, the police come and there was that much pressure put on Mrs. Thompson in the end, she had to say no. But the band st still practiced there. They still practiced there basically up until the police was bulldozed in, him in the 60s, later 60s, then it turned into St. Agnes School, and that lasted, I'm not sure, about year 2000 or something, I think it got pulled down. And now, as you can see, now it's private housing. But we've still got the fantastic pillars with the name on to remind us of the importance of this place. Now, one thing again on that night before the finish, because I'm going on forever, is some of the books say in, in that George Harrison audition for the Quarry Men here. Well, George was a very busy guy because he had a lot of auditions according to books. I think that one's being proved wrong. But I think because Johnny Guitar wrote in his diary George's audition, I think on the opening night George didn't play with them. So because he played an organ night, maybe Johnny thought it was an audition. But I think it's already been proved that by now. By David Bedford as well, I believe. <laughs> Whoever he is. <laughs> Whoever he is, yeah. And that's Balgowney for you. Rory's sister Iris, she, she was interested in what was going on in the morgue, but she was only 13. And Rory said, you can't come in, you're too young. And she pleaded with her mum by, mum, I wanna go, wanna go. So one night, Vi talked Rory, you gotta let her in. Well, she can stand at the back. So Iris was made up, she's done all the makeup, and she wanted to look grown up. So what does a young girl do to look grown up? She stuffs a whole load of cotton wool down her bra. And she's convinced she looked older. So she goes into the morgue and enjoys the entertainment of the evening. So when it's all over, Rory gets on the stage as he does every time to thank everyone for coming, thanks to bands for playing, and thanks to my little sister Alice who's standing at the back with cotton wool stuff down her bra. She starts crying, fully embarrassed, runs out the door and runs down Oakvale Park. After her comes her boyfriend at the time, George Harrison, runs after her grabs hold of her, gives a big hug, and gives her the first kiss. And Iris said it was fantastic. And for those who ask, because she later went out with Paul, George was the best kisser. 
So if you want to know more about Rory's Storm and the Hurricanes, then uh, get Anthony's great book, From a Storm to a Hurricane, and we'll put the link in the description below. So there you have it, the amazing story of the Morgue and of Rory Storm. It's such an important club, yet so few people know about it. And of course, the great connection with John, Paul and George. So if you want more like this, if you want to know more about the Quarrymen, then just click on this video and watch out for more great content. And we'll see you on the next one.